Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. On behalf of AIA Northern Virginia and the Alexandria Office of the Arts, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jacqueline Tool, and I'm the Executive Director of AIA Nova. You're in for a great session today. Not only does today's program, placemaking and storytelling, the intersection of art and architecture in Alexandria, earn you one AIA LU elective credit, you're also going to hear from three spectacular design professionals, Nina Cook-John, AIA NOMA, Dayton Schroeder, AIA no and NOMA, and Audra Heritages, AIA. Since we are joined today by individuals from the architecture industry and the arts community and members of our local communities, just a little bit about us. Um, the Northern Virginia chapter of the American Institute of Architects is a nonprofit professional association representing more than about over 1,200 Northern Virginia architects, interns, and allied professionals spread over 25 cities and counties in Virginia. Our mission is to activate the region's architecture community by supporting our members, advocating for the profession, and amplifying the power of design. Mika, would you please introduce the Office of the Arts? Yes, thanks, Jacqueline. Good afternoon. My name is Mika Doss. I'm the Public Art Senior Manager here with the Office of the Arts with the City of Alexandria. We're thrilled to co-sponsor this webinar today. The Office of the Arts, it's a division of the city's Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Activities Department. The mission of our office is to promote the value of arts and culture in the City of Alexandria by nurturing, investing in, and celebrating the creative contributions of artists and art organizations. We do this through grants, events, public art programs, including those that we're here to discuss today. Thanks for having us. Great. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to note. Please use the Q&A button in the Zoom to submit any questions you have for the panelists at any time during today's presentation. Uh, reserve the chat function to correspond directly with me should you have any technical or logistical questions. Uh, one additional feature to point out is that there is a closed captioning button to enable subtitles, which may be especially helpful during the short video Nina will be sharing later in her presentation. Um, anyone who's registered with their AIA number, your credit will appear directly on your AIA transcript within the next 10 business days. And uh, be sure that your screen reflects your first and last name so that your attendance can be verified and we'll probably be able to um, provide those learning units. So, all right, now that the boring stuff's out of the way, no need to delay any further. I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator today, Audra. Hi everyone, thank you guys for joining us today. We're really excited to give this presentation. Um, my name is Audra Harrigus, I'm with SOM, but I represent the AIA Northern Virginia Historic Resources Committee Chair um, and also the State of Virginia Committee Chair. Um, we're gonna be talking today about the intersection of art and architecture and placemaking in the public realm uh, with a heavy, emphasis on how can we make these places and spaces more equitable and how can we bring diversity into some of these areas where there isn't a whole lot right now. I'd like to introduce you and give a chance to uh, talk to our artist in residence, Nina Cookjohn, who just installed uh, one of her latest pieces down at the Alexandria waterfront. Thanks, Audra. It's great to be with you all today, though virtually I just got back a few weeks ago from Alexandria soon after the installation of our public art piece there. So I am going to share my screen. And please let me know if at any point anything is not showing up. Actually, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to do that again because I need to do share sound. Click on that. And once the audio portion does come up, it's just one screen with audio, it will be la um, just low the volume just because that's how it is that the embedded. So thanks again. Happy to be with everyone at AIA Nova, though virtually today. I wanted to start off by way of introducing my practice and where I am right now with this project, which actually was my undergraduate thesis, which speaks directly to the ideas of placemaking as it was looking at how um, immigrant populations, particularly in this case, immigrants who were from the Caribbean, 
who were in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, how we could kind of claim space for their um, participation in the public realm. And it was looking at taking over leftover spaces, whether between buildings, underneath um, railroads, to create public spaces, it was called the urban porch, by which these immigrants could really find their space in public space. So this was from 1995. But then by the time I entered the kind of professional practice, going through working with large architectural firms, working on cultural institutions, and then working on my own, primarily in residential architecture, as well as commercial design, really understanding that I wanted to re-engage with working in the public realm because I understood the kind of power of how we connect with each other in public. And being able to get back into the, that work started off by me doing a lot of competitions. So, you know, I had young kids at the time, so working late at night with, with my then business partner, but looking for projects that emphasized um, how we interacted in public. And so this is just one excerpt from a project which we named Power in the Dark, which was looking at women walking at night. It was It was an ideas competition for nighttime and it was any project related to nighttime. So I was looking at women walking, particularly in Brooklyn, in the Bed-Stuy area of Brooklyn at night, and how could we create a system that would empower women to be fearless as they walked at night? Because most of the reasons that um, women who walk more confidently at night are less likely to be attacked, and actually women are more likely to get attacked by people they know than just random people on the streets. So this took the form of these mostly light installations, again, in between buildings throughout New York City, and there was this idea of kind of an app which would crowdsource um, similar to how Waze works, where women would kind of send notes and messages to each other. So this was kind of the introduction to actually getting built work in the public realm, which then led to really in 2020 being given the commission for the point of action installation on flat iron plazas in New York City. There, um, this is a, an temporary installation which goes in every year in the Flatiron plazas. And this was during COVID. So I got the commission in June 2020. And so really understanding, we really realized the power of public places more than ever in the midst of COVID when we realized that most of our connection needed to happen outside in the fresh air. And how could we, and we also realized at that time, the power of person-to-person -person connections. I think after being um, denied of these connections with families and friends for months and months, we really understood how powerful that was. And we also really understood the power of or, um, you know, those who worked as um, nah, I'm blanking on the term, but it's an essential workers, right? And so really the primary question for this was how can we see each other? How can we see each other in the public realm? But also going back to tapping into my working in the creative means of collage and exploring all of that issues. So working through collage, working through model, really working through understanding the human body and how um, using kind of scale and proportion that before I was using working on residential projects, but bringing it out into the streets um, and bringing it to public space in a way that we could invite people to engage and to sit and stay. And so Point of Action was really developed as a combination of these nine unique structures, as well as the ground paintings, this idea of spotlighting people as they stepped out of their busy day into the artwork, giving them a chance to not only sit and rest a while, but a chance to kind of look back onto the busy city, but also look to each other and also give them a moment in which they could be seen, those who are often not seen. And so, you know, proportions and the body is always an important part of the work that I do for public art in installations, as well as materials, you know, how materials kind of come together and how light becomes an important part of 
um, understanding the process of creating interactive um, artwork in the public. And so how those projects also take on a new life, whether at night, how it takes on a new life just by the public interacting with it, because public art really is enlivened by people taking it on as their own and um, claiming it for themselves. And it moved to suburban situation in Montclair, New Jersey in a park there and is now in a completely rural environment in the Wasaik project in Wasaik, New York. And then the next project I wanted to talk a bit about is Shadow of a Face, which is the Harriet Tubman monument that just unveiled in um, Newark, New Jersey. And the um, new monument replaced the monument of Christopher Columbus, sits in a park that has several other monuments still in it. But also it was kind of this walk through park place. People didn't sit and stay. You can see all those pathways. They really just use it to walk through. So my primary um, concern was how do I, in the legacy of Harriet Tubman, create a community space in which all people in Newark can feel like they belong, a space in which they can connect to each other around the legacy of the Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman. And so it was important that all the elements of the monument both lifted Harriet Tubman up for the monumental feats that she created, but allowed us to connect to her and connect to her humanity by her face emerging at face level, but including benches that invite people to sit and stay, as well as educational information etched into its walls. And so really thinking about this as not only a space that you come and walk around, but a space that you engage with, you walk in and through, you connect with each other and you connect with the park. And the community engagement aspect was really an important part of the whole process. We had workshops uh, across the course of the year that included people etching into these tiles, as well as audio old. stories that we and collected. now I've been living in Newark for two years, two years now. I moved. I'm 57 years old. I've been living in Newark for a year now. I've lived all over the United States. And so the audio stories and the mosaics are embedded in the monument. So they become a continuation of the story of collaboration, which I believe the story of the Underground Railroad is a, is a story of community and collaboration. And so when I visited Alexandra for the first time in, well, not the first, but as I was hosted by the city of Alexandra in April of this year and started doing my continued research, I mean, I think we're all really enamored by the historical buildings and really the deep history of Alexandria. But these images of the ships that were unearthed um, in Alexandria really led me to believe, well, what, what else was happening there? What more could we see and understand of what Alexandria is and what it might have been like at that time? And so how could we think of this process of kind of peeling up and, and uncovering history, which is what happens at an archeological site? And um, so that was kind of the formal inspiration for the two boxes of oranges and Edmonia Jackson. And also looking at the manifest, the manifest of the ships that would have come through at the time, which would have included many different kinds of cargo and then collapsing that cargo, both the cargo of oranges and rum and wine, along with the cargo, which were people who were transported as part of the transatlantic and domestic slave trade. And so that text is seen on the ground and is a part of that kind of peeling that reminds us of the ship. It reminds us of the multi-layered understanding of what history is and history in Alexandria, but it also becomes a place that people can interact. It's brightly colored to draw you in um, and to engage with both the text as well as the physical elements, which should respond to, again, still the body um, and really become a place where people can connect to each other through the history. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nina, so much for sharing those pieces. Um, and if folks have questions, do feel free to type in the q and I'll try and keep up and, and ask them as we go. Um, and then I wanted to take a second and, and give Dayton a chance to introduce himself as well, real quick. Dayton, you're muted. Hopefully you can hear me, let me. Uh, now we can hear you. Go to the top. Yes. Forgot how to, oh, here we go. But yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dayton Schroeder and I'm gonna use, use, a, use a few minutes to talk, give you a little bit of overview of uh, my work and sort of what I've been up to recently. Um, I am a, I'm basically an architect, design director, and a vice president with uh, Smith Group, uh, based out of the Washington D.C. office. Um, and I, you know, in my role as design director, I'm you know a, a general practitioner, so I'm I'm doing everything from mixed use commercial, uh, residential, science and tech, higher education uh, buildings, um, and of course cultural buildings. Um, the, the scale of, of work that I do within the realm of, of, of the cultural studio is really vast. And we do everything from large scale interpretive campus master plans to uh, interpretive uh, building master plans. We do new buildings, we do building renovations, expansions. Um, we do uh, exhibition work um, and, uh, and we also do art. Um, so kind of like working at every scale of, of interpretation you know, from from mass, uh, you know, from mass campuses down to to intricate pieces of art. So I'll kind of walk you through, you know, you know, kind of give you a broad overview of some of the things that I've been up to, and um, and uh, and and then we'll have a conversation. So uh, just really quick, um, in terms of the general practice and focus, this is DC Water headquarters. This is a 150,000 square foot office building that was built over an existing uh, 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 pump station that, that manages 70% of the combined sewer, sewage and stormwater in the district. This is also the first uh, building in, in North America, I believe, uh, that utilizes a, a storm uh, heat recovery system. So we're basically utilizing uh, sewage to heat and cool this building. Um, next building that I wanted to highlight um, in the interest of, of highlighting the intersections of, of art and architecture was this neural behavioral science building, the Stephen Levin building at UPenn. Uh, this, this decorative scrim that you see uh, was basically a performative uh, sunshade system that was basically utilized to mitigate heat gain and glare. Um, and it was inspired, you know, by, you know, being this, being that this was a neural behavioral science building, it was inspired by um, the sort of network of neural synapses that that sort of created this, this interesting patterning. So, just wanted to give you a teaser of, 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 of the broad brush of general work. Um, but one of my specialties and one of my interests is really focused within the realm of black historic sites of trauma and resilience. Um, I you know, do a lot of work around you know, uh, slave pens, slave uh, you know, plantations um, and the like, and, and you know, are interpreting, interpreting this work at different scales. So I just kind of want to walk you through kind of a, an, an overview of actually some of the some of the things that I actually have right now on the boards. Um, we're working down in Whitney Plantation, uh, Wallace, Louisiana, actually. Uh, you know, this is, Whitney Plantation is the only uh, plantation museum dedicated to interpreting plantation life from the perspective of the enslaved. Um, interestingly enough, most plantation museums, uh, you sort of marginalize and overlook this, this history. Um, you know, close to home, 1315 Duke Street, euphemously known as Freedom House. Um, we're involved right now in, in, in basically a envisioning an interpretive master plan, a uh, long-term master plan for this, this building, uh, the, the administrative building, I should say. Um, working down at UT Austin, this is an interesting project. It's called Sweat and Painters, and it's named after a, um, a historic uh, uh, Supreme Court case called Sweat and Painters. Sweat and Painter, and it basically involved, it was an integration case that involved uh, the admittance of uh, He-Man Sweat into the School of Law. The, uh, the case was led by Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP, 
and uh, basically became the precursor to Brown versus Board of Education. So, so that's one half of the story. Uh, the other half of this story is that Painter, who was the university president, he's the, he's the gentleman of the, on, the, on the left here. He was the university president at the time of the Supreme Court case, but he was also a zoologist and he was one of the world's most celebrated eugenicists and uh, performed some pretty uh, egregious experimentation and, and research on the campus. So the other part of this, this commemorative project uh, is, is also interpreting the difficult history around you know, racial science and, and, uh, and, and basically what happened here at, at UT Austin. Um, another, another project that we're currently involved in is a, a major expansion at the uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which seems uh, pretty benign on its surface, uh, but the campus of VMFA, as some of you may know, was a former slave plantation. And then it, it later on during the Civil War evolved into an old soldier's home um, for, for Confederate soldiers. Um, the building on the right, um, is actually uh, considered a, a, you know, basically a Confederate chapel. It still sits on the, on the campus now. And, you know, we were also just blocks away from Monument Avenue with the, you know, the, the, the infamous Robert E. Lee statue, you know, and the charge here was to, is to create, you know, a welcoming and inclusive <laughs> museum. So, so doing that within, within the context, the sort of social context of everything happening within, within uh, the city, and in the context of these, these you know, relics from the Confederacy it's just has been a really interesting challenge uh, to say the least. Um, another active project, this is you know, switching over to exhibits. Um, this is, a, this is an ex a traveling fine art exhibit. Um, uh, right now it's at the Baltimore Museum of Art. It's called The Culture. And this is basically uh, a fine, uh, fine art uh, installation that basically provides a comprehensive social history of hip hop. You know, it kind of goes underneath the uh, or beyond the sort of uh, you know external aesthetics of hip hop and explores the sort of uh, you know social, cultural, historical underpinnings of of of, of phenomena that have shaped and evolved to creating what hip hop is today as a global phenomenon. So that's going to be traveling to to St. Louis. Uh, Frankfurt, Germany, and then it'll go on to uh, uh, the Louis Vuitton Foundation um, in Paris because we have a we have a lot of we have a few Virgil Abloh pieces. So the idea was, in a sense, to kind of bring it bring it back home. Um, another project in Virginia, uh, the Commonwealth, is the as a you know blue sky concept uh, for the National Slavery Museum. We were hired by the, the city of Richmond, which which basically owns the site that is. Um, that contains the archaeological remains of the Lumpkin Slave Jail. Um, you know, most of the most of the slave jail was believed to have been buried underneath I-95. Um, for those of you who don't know, it was it was a, a complex, a slave plant complex, complex owned and operated by Robert Lumpkins, um, and it, it consisted of his his personal residence, a hotel, a tavern, and you know what is considered a, a slave jail. Um, the, the residents and hotel were in fact buried underneath the construction of I-95, but the tavern and the slave jail are in fact buried 15 feet below a uh, uh, asphalt parking lot that sits between Main Street Station and I-95. So the, the goal of this project is to basically, um, you know, unearth the archeology, span um, you know, preserve it and basically interpret it around with this 100,000 square foot new uh, museum. Uh, just a couple more views. Um, and, you know, well, I could get into this. I could get into that more later. I'll just keep going in the interest of time. Another, uh, another uh, project that I wanted to highlight was Society's Cage. This is a traveling art installation. Basically, uh, I like to say it's, it's literally the shape of raci racism. We took, uh, you know, we, we started with the premise of what is the value of Black life? Um, and, and those, the question of what, it, what is the value of black life sort of evolved into other probing questions. What are the, you know, what institutional structures have impacted black life? How have those structures evolved and changed over time? Um, what are the, the sort of gender and, 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 and racial discrepancies inherent in those patterns? And those, those probing questions ultimately led us to the institutions of lynching, 
mass incarceration, capital punishment, and police killings. And out of that data, um, you know, we, we basically formed a cube. It's a, it's a three by 15 foot cube uh, that's made up of uh, five, five, sorry, 500 one inch diameter uh, pipes that are hanging on a, on a manifold. And essentially um, on, on each of the facades, if you sort of connect the dots, um, uh, the hanging rods or hanging pipes, it basically forms a linear bar graph and that lin each of those linear bar graphs on the four facades is literally 400 years. It's a statistical bar graph of 400 years of data that describes how African Americans have been impacted by those 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 four institutions. So we then we then took the data as inscribed on the four facades, and then we mathematically and computationally triangulated it into one form. So that that form, that single form, and the re the results of of that triangulation is essentially a uh, literally the shape of racism, 400 years of, of, of you know, anti-Black racialized state violence. Um, so when you enter this edifice, you're, you're literally standing underneath the symbolic representation of, of racism. Um, we were fortunate enough, um, this was conceived in the aftermath of 2020, um, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to place it on the National Mall. Um, totally unexpected. Um, it was totally coincidental. There was a there was a vacation that you know the, the site was basically vacated by another party, became available, and and we took the opportunity to to, to get this up and running. Um, this is another view. You kind of kind of see how it's kind of situated on axes with the national capital. And in the previous slide, you could see how it was on axes with the the national monument. Um, and here you can kind of get a sense of the profile of how that, that linear bar graph kind of forms itself on, on each of the facades. Um, just another view. We, we also commissioned a, uh, a soundscape for this installation. Um, the idea was that, um, you know, we wanted to acknowledge the, the death of George Floyd, the eight minutes and 46 seconds that George Floyd suffered at the hands of police. So we basically commissioned a, a, a soundscape um, that basically was is it's eight minutes and 46 seconds long and basically plays on a loop over and over and over again. It's also um, structured in four parts to correlate with the, you know, the, those, the four uh, institutions of racialized state violence. Um, the, on the apron of the installation, we have a lot of, uh, you know, it was really designed to sort of be a uh, sort of a triggering experience. We have a lot of statistical data about the four institutions of racialized state violence. And the idea was to trigger the visitor and inspire them to actually enter into the edifice. And, and what, we, what, we were, what we challenged everyone to do here was to basically um, take a few minutes to reflect on the moment um, and to, to you know, basically share on social media with the hashtag Society's Cage, um, their thoughts are around, uh, around the moment and how they felt um, and to share it with friends and family. So the idea here was that, you know, we, we, were using, we were using our visitors basically as an extension of ourselves um, uh, to begin to actually have difficult conversations with segments of the, the, you know, our society or people in our society who, we, who are out of reach for us or with, with this installation and, and empowering the visitor to be able to, um, you know, facilitate those conversations with their, those difficult conversations with their friends and their family. Um, from there, we, we, you know, we started to invite, you know, like-minded social justice activists into the space. The woman on the left is, is Yari Delancourt. She's a, she's a trained Alvin Ailey uh, dancer. And I invited her to perform a uh, eight minute and 46 second dance piece to with the eight minute and 46 second soundscape within the edifice. So it's just this, it, you know, it's, you could look it up on YouTube, Yari Delancourt, Society's Cage. And and, um, and and basically, it's this just this wonderful triangulation of of you know three dimensions of art kind of happening simultaneously in this in this very moment. So I'd encourage everyone to look that up. Um, since then, uh, the installation has gone on, and I won't go on, on in, ad infinitum about each of these installations. But essentially, what we're doing is we are taking this installation to various sites of power. And basically using the, the, this conversation about the, the, you know, the history of racialized state violence within the context of sites of power 
to begin to have uh, more nuanced and, and, and more nuanced conversations around various localities. So we brought it to Baltimore, uh, Maryland at the War Memorial Plaza, right in front of City Hall. Police station is just off the page behind us to the left. So it's situated in, you know, sort of in this, this moment of power. And again, allows us to begin to um, have some, some necessary but difficult conversations around, around these institutions. It's the mayor on the left, my co-designer, Julian Arrington, to the right of me. This is actually situated in the opposite direction. This is the war, this is the actual war memorial building that you're sort of on axes with. And I'll, I'll just kind of cut through these. From then, we went on to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma for the 1921 um, centennial events uh, around the, the, you know, the 1921 racial um, uh, massacre at, at, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we put this kind of on, on ground zero of that, the, of that, you know, that historical moment, uh, the intersection of Cameron and Greenwood. Um, the building that you see uh, beyond is the Vernon AME Chapel. That is the only black owned um, uh, structure that, that survived the massacre. In fact, if you, if you, if that horizontal white band that you see basically separates um, the, 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 what was, what was destroyed from what, what remains. So basically everything below that band, oh, that's cool. Uh, everything below that band was, uh, was, was intact. And in fact, there was a contingency of about 15 people, I believe, who, who took refuge in the basement um, and were able to, to, to live out the massacre you know, um, safely. Um, everything above that was rebuilt to match the historical building. I'm just gonna rush through here. You know, this is this is you know everywhere that we've gone. Um, somehow organically, educators have taken to this and 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 utilized it as a space to facilitate um, you know activities for summer school um, and and uh, in some cases after school programs. Um, so that that's actually again that's happening here or organically, uh, where these students uh, were you know found found themselves uh, found the space, came into the space, and be able to utilize it. And again, again, continuing to invite, you know, like-minded social justice activists, you know, these two young ladies, we just stumbled upon them. They saw, actually, you know, was involved in installing this on this site, and they, they came up while we were installing it. We're curious um, about what it was, and we explained to them what it was and got started talking and, and found out they were dancers. And they came out when we had the installation up and running and did this beautiful interpretive dance in the same spirit as Yari. You know, they did another, they did an eight minute and 46 second interpretive dance, dance piece within the space and uh, except it was two of them. And this is sort of just some snapshots of how that played out. Um, just another shot. Um, since then, we've gone on to Oakland, California, California um, Frank Ogawa Plaza, otherwise known as Oscar Grant Plaza at City Hall. Um, this was another sort of organic uh, community moment that happened around the installation. This, this happened in the aftermath of the Buffalo shootings. There was a contingency of, of, of community activists um, that, that basically um, gathered and met up at City Hall. And just coincidentally, the installation was there and sort of became this sort of symbolic backdrop and, and they just acquiesced around it. They didn't even, you know, they had no idea it was there. They just found themselves there and it just became this really powerful backdrop for this moment. Um, yeah, and, and, it, and we, you know, we got some really powerful for people, people come out. This is Dr. Um, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, Net, I'm going to mess it up. Dr. Netta Rue, he was the he was the the uh, founder of the Sacramento Black Panther Party. So, you know, again, in the in the in the interest of interpreting local histories, you know, we had a lot of you know black former Black Panther Party members here to interpret racialized state violence within the context of that broader history. So again, it 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 really kind of allows us to to kind of bring this to places and really kind of use it as a, as a focused lens to interpret these localized histories and, and bring them to the surface to have some, some interesting conversations and then more more interpretive dance poet youth poet laureate came out you know so i think i think that's it you know i like to i like to just say you know with this with this project i I'd like to close out by saying we took the ugliness of racism and we rendered it in a beautiful way to draw people in to have uncomfortable but 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 
uh, you know, necessary conversations around racial, racial reconciliation and justice. I think that's it. Thank you, Dayton. So now I wanted to take a, a brief moment and try and go into some of the, the Q&A session that we were going to have between um, Nina and Dayton to discuss some of these things, which I think most of them have been sort of touched on by both of their presentations. Um, what the first question that we would have for them, it's just how would you go through and say that art and architecture can work together to kind of pay tribute to the past and yet create spaces um, that are more equitable and talk, you know, and bring people together to talk about um, class and cultural and racial biases that they have and how can we bring this together and bring it to light? I, I feel like your work speaks to how to demonstrate that. I think I saw some themes, but I'd love to hear back from you guys on, we're speaking to other architects, so it would be great to know of ideas and how they can try to start to integrate some of these themes into their own work. I'll jump in. I think there are, you know, some things in terms of media that we use as architects anyway, you know, how we understand space and how we understand the power of space to, um, you know, how people occupy it, how we kind of keep people out or bring people in, and how you add on top of that some of the things that oftentimes are relegated only to art, you know, which really is the more kind of intuitive understanding of what people react to, you know, and, and some of it might feel ornamental, you know, especially like when I was working on um, the Tubman Monument, you know, I mostly work with modern um, renditions of things, but considering whether I was going to include an actual representation of Tubman's image one way or another, and I landed on that that was really an important thing that needed to be added, you know, because Black people have for so long not seen their physical representation in public space that even though in general our monuments are moving towards abstraction, this particular for this particular one, it really was important that um, a figurative image was included. I just remember coming upon Yvette um, Simone Lee's work brick house on the High Line, which was this oversized figure of a, a slightly abstracted black woman on a face and just seeing her and being feeling physically connected to that as a black woman and realizing that that is important. So really drawing upon our power of understanding space and how we can draw people in and have them connect in that space, but layering on top of that with certain, you know, things like color, like in my architectural practice, I don't use color and realizing how important color can be in just bringing about kind of powerful react reactions that draw people in. You know, the, the piece in Alexandria is bright and colorful, but when you get in and you get close to it and you start reading, you know, people who were treated like cargo and they're amongst the cargo listed, it's a kind of powerful reaction that you get from people. So I'm sort of having to elevate the perspective of people that didn't have their perspectives even considered. It sounds like is a really important aspect in how we go through and start to approach this. Absolutely. Dayton, did you have anything you wanted to add to that as well of how art and architecture intersect to kind of highlight inequities and hopefully start conversations about how to move things forward in a positive manner? Yeah, I think, I mean, the word equity kind of stands out to me in that question, right? And I think as, as architects and, and designers, artists, I think we have to understand that there's a difference between equity and equality, right? I think equality refers to treating all individuals or groups the same way without considering their differences or varying needs. Um, but on the other hand, equity is more about, um, you know, sort of acknowledging and, and addressing the diverse needs and experience of, of individuals um, and, and groups, um, and particularly those who've been historically marginalized and underrepresented. So I think um, you know that you know there's there's so much there's so much sort of misnomers about you know about kind of this just sort of you know even handed even handed treatment um, of, of of varying communities and I think I always I always challenge people to you know start by listening and you know really know the community you're serving and really kind of understand 
um, what those those, those sort of um, structures and, and their, their, the history of, of those communities and how you can best, you know, provide, um, uh, uh, you know, a design that, that really kind of focuses on their unique needs um, as opposed to the sort of sort of formulaic <laughs> approach of, of, of just making the assumption that we are, you already know what this community needs. Um, and I would also say, you know, at, at least in the work that I do, um, since it's largely focused on, um, you know, sites of, of trauma and resilience. I mean, I just think architects and artists have to become adept at navigating through conversations centered on difficult history and just get comfortable with being, being uncomfortable, right? Um, I think we, we have to develop a working palette that incorporates truth telling um, and critique of established systems of injustice and injury um, uh, because there's, there's power in truth telling. And, it, 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 and I think ultimately the truth telling can be an agitator um, for accountability and action. And, and if we can't be honest about race, racial reconciliation, we can't be honest about racial reconciliation if we don't, if we don't at first come to terms with the truth, yes. right? Yep. So the work should transcend a need to just make us feel good and actually inspire us to become active agents of change. I think that's a great response. I think some things I saw that were overlap in both of um, the work presented by both of you were sort of this integration of light into the work that you're working on, um, and then this experience over time, and that how much having whatever it was, the architecture or the art piece, was definitely enlivened by people. Those are sort of like three of the major overlaps I saw between the art and the architectural pieces that really helped highlight and share some of the themes that you guys were talking about. Um, and really got people connected and draw. And like you said, Nina, drew people in to go through and do this. Um, moving into sort of the next topic, which is community. I know in terms of historic preservation, um, you know, it's, they're finally starting to look at that and look at some of our standards and things like that um, and analyze what are the best ways to go forward. And that was obviously brought about by the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, there are certain entities that have gone through and actually done audits of their own preservation uh, standards and societies. I know Baltimore, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and Austin, Texas started to do this as well. There are new grants coming out. The National Trust for Historic Preservation has the Telling the Full Story Preservation Fund. The National Park Service has the Underrepresented Communities Grants. Um, both of these are intended to diversify the natural register and the historic preservation. Um, so how can placemaking bring these communities together um, that are more inclusive, collaborative, and responsive. Did I jump in, Nina? Or yeah, I, I was on mute because my dog's barking. So <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you know, architects and artists need to work with communities, right? We need to create spaces that are that are grounded in the lived experiences of of the people who use them. Um, this, um, I think this can involve engaging community members in the design process, obviously, um, incorporating their feedback and their ideas, um, you know, creating space that reflect their sort of unique cultural needs, their social needs, their environmental values. Um, and we also have to empower the, the architects and artists of these communities to lead the work in their communities. I think so often um, what, what happens, um, at least in, in the experiences that I've encountered, my, my personal experiences, is that um, you, you sort of get pushed aside, um, um, you know, to allow sort of the, the experts or the people with the, with the experience to kind of come in and, and, and uh, you know, work with these communities and, and you and you realize well gosh you know like you, you, there's intrinsic value that we bring but with with our lived experiences and our direct experience in these places and and i think that again in terms of the, the in the equity equation of things i think it's important to actually um you know look inward as architects and and designers and and allow the people who are of these spaces to be leaders in helping to shape and design and interpret um these spaces um, I also think that placemaking, um, I think um, it's not a static process. I mean, I think it involves a continuous process of, of feedback and adaptation um, where the, you know, the, the des these designs, I mean, I think they have to respond to the changing needs and, and preferences of the community. 
Um, I think, you know, you know, one of the one of the beauties and the benefits to, you know, society's cage is I think is a traveling installation, as you see that, that we're able to kind of travel it and engage with communities and, and, and almost like reinterpret it in, in completely different ways. I mean, every everywhere that we go, there's a new focus because there's 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 a unique history inherent in each place that that needs focus, that needs attention. And so I think um, so it's you know, like adapting adapting the storytelling process, even as your art installation moves to different pieces, absolutely. or in, in Anita's case, it's as people go through an experience, various people from all different backgrounds would come through New York City. So they're all, you know, specifically I'm thinking, and they would experience it differently and they would go through and see things differently and have, being able to open people's eyes to various perspectives, I think is, is hugely important, it sounds like as well. And then also Dayton, as you're saying, the critical role of architects and artists as being leaders, you know, and how can we embolden people to kind of go through and do that? Nina, I'll, I'll let you respond to that the question as well. Yeah, and I think for me in thinking about historical preservation, which I'm definitely a fan of, but having to really consider what history are you preserving? Who wrote that history? What history was excluded? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a retelling of history. I mean, even in the case of historic Alexandria, you know, and just thinking about that old waterfront, there were a lot of things that were happening at that as a working waterfront. And it doesn't show up anywhere in the built environment of what we experience when tourists visit Alexandria, right? That's as a historical town. So um, one is making room in the built environment and going back to this idea of placemaking and how how do people feel ownership of certain spaces and how that feeling of ownership and belonging you know my family has been here for generations and generations too but we don't show up in the built environment at all and when we start to show up in the built environment then we feel that much more ownership and citizenship, frankly, right? And connected, and connected and strengthened. Yeah, strengthened when exactly. you actually belong to the community instead of being excluded from it. And can become active participants in actually determining what actually happens there. So it's beyond just putting up pretty images in public space. It's a wider understanding of how placemaking and belonging and cultural sensitivity leads to empowerment and active citizenry. And it's not a retelling of the story. I think it must be said that it's more of a telling the whole story, right? Exactly. Which is there are multiple people experiencing these time and places from a variety of backgrounds and they have very different experiences and being able to highlight all those experiences and it gets into the whole being equitable and equity and how do we go through and, and go through and tell everybody's story fairly and represent all the different components to it because some people may have thought something was wonderful and other people's had a vastly different experience with certain places and not to diminish anyone's enjoyment or anyone's ideals of the places that they've been or sometimes in in some cases when we see the statues even some of the the role models that were there's an overlap in the fact that these historical figures um, they're human. They're, they have great qualities and terrible sometimes as well. But we we all want to look up and admire people. And I think that there is an overlap and an intersection between people from Black communities, Native American, um, <laughs> our typical white European. And I think that's the part that we can go through and try to highlight is just because this person didn't do everything correctly um, doesn't mean that, you know, there aren't other people from other communities that highlight those exact same qualities that we really admire in these people we've had in our hearts for years. And so I think it's telling the whole story. And like you guys said, it's being more honest about it. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had time for more of the Q and a portion, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask the one question we got in the chat so far. Um, thank you guys. You've been absolutely wonderful. Um, so the question in the chat is, when designing computer software, there is a user testing phase to make sure it performs the way it will be used compared to the way it was designed. Is there a similar testing of architectural art during its development to explore how the public will experience it compared to the intent of its design? That's a tricky question. <laughs> well, I mean, my, my feeling about that is the power of art is that people can interpret it in different ways. Like I might have um, a conceptual way that I develop a project 
and, and a way that I hope people will interact with it. But people see all kinds of things because again, people are bringing their own backgrounds, their own kind of world understanding to public space and to public art. And I think the beauty of it, you know, especially in those three videos that I showed from, you know, the point of action, like the beauty of it is seeing people interact with it in different ways, in ways that you hadn't even thought of. They've made it their own and they're going to see what they want to see in it. They're going to interact with it. And you have to be, as an architect, I think oftentimes you want to control things, right? This space is for learning. This space okay. is for eating. This space, we found out during COVID, we're going to do work in the living room. We're going <laughs> to eat in the kitchen. We're going to, right? You're, it's, it's fluid. And I think we have to accept that and relinquish control and allow for people to make the spaces and the places, especially public places, whatever they want to do with it. I mean, I, I, I just jump in to say, I, we, I didn't include any imagery, any conceptual in, imagery of society's cage, but oddly enough and eerily enough, um, there were moments where the, 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 lived, the lived installation, like literally was exactly what we had conceptualized, you know, like, the, you know, literally image for image, you know, um, just swap the faces It didn't change much. Out. I remember yeah, seeing it. it. <laughs> that was fascinating. And then the other thing I'll say is that, um, you know, when we embarked to, to, to initially put the installation somewhere in the city, we, our initial reaction was to put it on uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza, um, you know, because instinctively we're thinking, wow, you know, that, that place is already has a critical mass of people that are going there, a lot of focus and attention and energy, and this could really enhance that space. But the city, the city's hands were tied with public permitting, and they suggested that we go to National Park Service, which is how we ended up uh, uh, on the National Mall. And we were like literally in proximity to like the RNC commission, but you know, Trump re-election uh, uh, convention was happening right down the street. We were, there were folks from that, that convention that were walking over to the site. And it was fascinating. One of the, the, the most enriching things was really the people watching, right? So we had these, we had these uh, banners on the perimeter of the site explaining to the public what the installation was. So people would walk up, they would read the banners. And so from a distance, I would watch their body language and you could literally read the politics, their politics in their body language, just in, in terms of their facial reactions, their body language, and, you know, that they would even if they would get tense, you know, but 99.9% .9 of the time, even if they express some level of uncomfort, they all advanced forward. I, I would think hope that, that everyone would express all, some uncomfort about a racial, about talking about racism. I think it makes everyone uncomfortable to think about absolutely. prejudice and things like that. So I think that that should be, you know, that's interpreted as hopefully we're human um, when going through an experience in something terrible and we all will be averse to reacting to something along the terms of, of that. But I also like the fact from a microcosm perspective it's like you could have gone and put it on black lives platter like matter plaza there and it intensifies the story there which is great but just like going through and promoting someone who isn't getting the seat at the table you're going to have to have someone promoting you and and advocating for you so you became an advocate for this on the national mall as opposed to if you've just gone in and stayed within the own realm there which is something that's i think important to go through and make sure we get everyone motivated to do this because just because if you're somewhere in a meeting on a part of a project or a presentation and you everyone looks very similar, just remember those people who aren't at the table and how right. can we try to draw those people in or give them an opportunity to be there, um, you know, and how can we advocate for them because they aren't there. And if it wasn't for someone who advocated for us, we wouldn't have the opportunity to be there either. Well said. Well, in the effort of trying to keep to everyone's schedule, um, we're like one minute over, which I think that's <laughs> the applause in and of itself. Um, if no one has any additional questions, I didn't see any else in the chat. Um, I just want to thank you all for attending today and really huge thank you to the Alexandria Arts Council for um, putting this together. But Thank you so much, Dayton and Nina, so, so much for joining us and talking about this really important topic that we hope to expand on further in the future, so. Thank you yeah, all, thanks, this thanks is great. Looking forward to meeting you both in person. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I gotta go get some sleep. I, I haven't slept yet. I was in a red 